What's going on everybody, it's Frito here for your Overwatch big roundup of all sorts of stuff. Jeff Kaplan's on the forums, you get more OWL tokens from watching now. We're gonna break down some of the biggest plays from the first day of Overwatch League, and we'll get EQO's opinion on the GOATS meta at the end of the video. First up, Jeff Kaplan seemingly crawls out of hibernation to speak on the forums to respond to a post that talks about solo healing and tanking feeling horrible to play. Forum poster Fritz says, because there's no way of your 3 to 4 DPS will peel for you or actually contest the objective typically because those characters don't right they run and hide for themselves most damage players run off and do their own thing and don't actually support the team oriented aspects of the game if triple or quad dps ever becomes the standard meta you'll find that no one wants to play tank or healer anymore because of constantly being focused and flanked without any help isn't any fun to play keep in mind as well in the overwatch league we have seen three and four dps be a sort of pseudo counter meta composition and the best tank to play with it is wrecking ball because he's the one that needs the least amount of resources to stay alive and mercy because she has the most mobility to just stay the heck out of the way right and be the hardest to focus two highest mobility characters in their role are the ones that get played in these really wacky quick play-esque comps a lot of people go to anna because they think she has a ton of healing but she's very exploitable whereas mercy can fly away and wrecking ball spikes so much health that he can kind of get away with being the solo tank although the rest of your team won't have a shield to play around and probably die anyway jeff kaplan does respond to this and said we actually tried a mode we called 411 because it limited comps to one tank, one healer, and the rest DPS. It was not fun to play and we didn't enjoy it. The way the game is tuned, the importance it placed on the lone tank or lone support was too significant. Also, we've all evolved as players since 2016, and we're much better these days at melting the tank or melting the healer than we used to be. Once your lone tank or lone healer died, it felt like you were forced to completely regroup with no chance of pulling out a win. It was a good experiment for us to try and led to a lot of good discussion, but yeah, wasn't fun. The thread goes on a bit and Agonista asks, were you guys expecting 222 to be the standard go-to comp when the game launched? Does the team have an opinion about what distribution among the three roles is best for the game? Jeff Kaplan responds, well, just speaking for myself here, but I expect one to two tanks and one to two supports with more variants. I also expected more hero switching. Naively, I didn't expect maining or one tricking to be so dominant. We imagined a world where players would be okay with Torbjorn on defense, but not playing him on attack. The main slash one tricking mindset led to us having to rework those characters to fit with how the game eventually evolved to be played. I guess what I'm saying is we hope to be able to create more highly situational characters with the thought that players would switch in situations where those characters weren't as viable. We like the direction things evolved and in hindsight it seems obvious that they would evolve that way. It's not that one direction is good or bad they're just different directions and we adapted to what the player base was doing rather than fighting against their instincts. Well do I have a lot to say about this. Listen, don't get me wrong, I am super happy to see more insights into the dev team. I hope they would put even more stuff on the forums. It's been a very long time, so I'm glad that we have something to talk about from the devs. However, the content of what's being discussed here feels like it's out of a time capsule. And realistically, the only conclusion we can come is, yeah, to agree with Jeff, I think they did a really good job with the reworks of Symmetra and Torbjorn to fit to how the player base wanted to play the game. Those are absolutely great things. Made the characters more fun, more viable on both sides of attack and defense, and are an example of the dev team molding the game experience to fit the way the players play it. Okay, that's a good start. Now, why can't we have a map selection veto, or at least bands that we don't want to queue for, like we do in StarCraft or many, many other games? Call of Duty lets you have three maps before, that kind of thing. Where are we at with roll queue? Much of the competitive community thinks that hero bands are necessity if we ever want to not have only six heroes get played in a mirror match forever. And to this point of not seeing one tricks and maining heroes to be a thing, here's Slasher's response. It's almost like there's been years of data before Overwatch's release from Dota and League of Legends that shows people main heroes, and even within Overwatch itself, since the beta over three years ago, Overwatch had one tricks and mirror matchups from the start. But no, who could have saw this coming? It goes on, people main characters in fighting games, in Team Fortress 2, which is literally a direct inspiration for Overwatch. People like to show off their skins and play the game for fun in one of the most teamwork required competitive video games ever made. Please, Jeff. And I would add to this argument too, Overwatch is too hard for you to play multiple things. Most times when somebody says, man, I play everything, they're usually just not very good at anything. And don't get me wrong, I fall in that same camp too, where I try to probably play too many different heroes and I would be better if I specialized a bit more, but I like that play style. I'm probably the type of player Jeff envisioned for the game, someone who wants to play all the characters if they can, but most people aren't like that and they probably shouldn't be like that, competitively speaking. It's just not a viable thing to do. There's way too many things to master in each role and even 
in each sub role within that role, like projectile versus hit scan. The way you aim, your sensitivity is going to be really different. Main healer versus flex heal. Yeah. So again, glad Jeff popped on the forums to say hi. But for us anyway, it's never been an issue that Blizzard can't design interesting new heroes or balance the game in a new way that creates openings for heroes to be more playable. They've done that consistently over three years. That's not the issue. What we want to see is core structural change to either the incentive structure or the format of how we play ranked. This whole maining and one-tricking thing makes even more sense with what roll queue or lock 222 or the idea I proposed sort of a internal role picking stage as you enter the match. Because as it turns out, it's very important to the player base for us to be able to reliably play the roles and mains that we have. And even more importantly, to the original subject line of the thread, not be put into situations where as the solo healer or solo tank that it feels unplayable. Because actually, as we've given advice in those types of situations, sure, you can play Mercy or Hammond, but sometimes you're better off just playing another DPS that goes off and plays for themselves. And everyone at the same time is trying to play for frags, because if you're trying to push in as a tank that needs resources and you have a team comp that doesn't give any resources, well, you're just not really playing the game, are you? You're just absorbing damage for no reason. So yeah, it's kind of tricky. And advice like that is very counterintuitive to people's approach to what they assume Overwatch is. And then of course, the bigger problem on top of that is that when the play is reliably one tank, one heal, everybody locking DPS at a lot of the ranks and everybody's doing that, those core competencies of Overwatch aren't really being enforced or taught. And all of a sudden you get up to middle and upper ranks with really bad habits, not really having learned the team aspects of the game that you would think would be required to get there. All right, all right, time for some good news. This was on the Overwatch League website, but they didn't explain it that you're getting more owl tokens than you used to. It used to be that you get one owl token per map you watched, which you would think would turn out to be a lot, but the new system's even more. Now instead, you get three owl tokens per hour of watch time. And if we compare to yesterday's broadcast, which went eight and a half hours, that's 24 owl tokens, and we're halfway up to our next hour as well, whereas there was only 16 maps played yesterday. So we're getting a sizable boost in the amount of returns that we're getting towards our next Overwatch League skin. And also as well, this helps incentivize watching everything that isn't just a map being played. So the pre-show, the stuff in between, all that. Moving on, we thought we would break down some of the coolest Overwatch League plays from day one. The best match of the day for my money was the Gladiators versus Soul Dynasty, where both teams were pulling out some seriously big plays, but also a few blunders as well. Throughout the day, I think we've seen some Reaper that proves why Reaper probably shouldn't be played ever at the professional level. He's really bad. Just as well, this Symmetra pick by Sure4 didn't seem to do a whole lot. First of all, this rotation to the backside of the hotel with the teleporter, I don't really see as an advantage. I think if they just take it to the point, they'd be a lot stronger, which is eventually what they do when they get the Symmetra wall up, which is when this pick starts to look really good because then you just have way more tanking on your side and the enemy is forced to respect it. Keep in mind, the wall will block shatters. It'll block brig stuns, not to mention tons of range damage. So just play inside that and they start to cap the point almost for free. All the while, as the brawl starts to extend a little bit, sure for does get up to the level three charge and he's going to charge his ultimate in like half of a second, which is definitely where this pick looks good. The only problem is the amount of threat that the sim player has to put herself in in order to start to get this value is the problem. It's very similar to Reaper, who we saw just get stunned and battered all over the map whenever he got picked. It's tough out here being a squishy character in the middle of everything. And the sim wall looks to be quite strong yet again. However, the Graviton is massive, so they give it up. They just swap the Symmetra at that point. You can see where the potential of the character is, but I think that if we really want to see Symmetra be viable, she can't have a worse range on her primary than Zarya. Next up on Horizon Lunar Colony, we got to see Roar make a big play, coming in loud and proud like a Katy Perry song, in space, no one can hear you scream. As it turns out, the boop from the doorway leading into space is enough momentum to just carry them all the way off of the map. Roar's Primal Rage kills everybody there, but you learn something new every day. But Soul Dynasty gets the Reaper on point, and it kind of works, I guess. I think you have to really ask yourself how effective Reaper is when Zarya is very easily getting more ult charge than he is. But the series all came down to the last team fight of Route 66. Remember, this is a matchup between Fissure and his former team, LA Gladiators, which was, from what we can tell, a pretty bad breakup. Coming right out of the gate with their first game of the season up against them, I bet Fissure really had some adrenaline pumping for this match. And despite Roar playing pretty well for the Gladiators most of the series, I think Fissure, especially as the series went on, really turned it up to 11 with the big main tank play making. Who's better than Fissure? Nobody. Out footsies the Rhine Shatter 
there. And I mean, this is a fight with no ults on either side, really. Only the shatters to make a play. He gets bobbled up into the sky, but is able to sneak an earth shatter via the blind spot of the payload to punish the oncoming defenders. And that leaves a lot of upset LA Gladiators fans in the audience. Soul off to a big start, considering there was a lot of question marks on them at the start of the season. And for those of you who are hyped for the Dynasty last season, gotta say, Ryu J. Hong really stepped up this series. He had trance like every fight, popped a ton of sick transcendences to save his team. Jexa, their new recruit on the Lucio was looking good. And of course, in a tank dominated meta, a lot falls on Fissure's hands. And I gotta say, played quite reserved. Usually we're used to him going in a bit too deep and being greedy with resources. Looks like much more of a team player, at least thus far in game one. So excited to see how that develops. But that's it for our breakdown for the best game of the day. Now I'll leave you with a closing interview we had with EQO. He said that the win up against London Spitfire definitely was a bit of revenge for them since that after losing the grand finals, London talked some mad trash. We're happy to see the fusion back in fighting form. And here's EQO's thoughts on what Blizzard should do when balancing the GOATS meta. Okay, now to the GOATS meta specifically, is there anything in the comp that you think is important for Blizzard to change moving forward? Like what are the key things that stand out that keep it being so strong? Because they very obviously were looking to nerf it to this point, but we're still seeing quite a lot of it. So is there any like particular characters or interactions that are important for them to, to mix up to see that change? Uh, I think probably Brig is one of the biggest components in like the GOATS meta. If Brig wasn't a thing, then it would be a lot more difficult to execute those tanky compositions simply because of the burst healing and AOE healing she has. And also the fact that she has a shield and she can sustain herself and she can like sustain her supports. It just enables too much healing at the same time. And it's very difficult for flankers, especially like attacking someone with a shield that also has a very you know fast stun. But the reason I think nerfing Brig won't be the best idea is because if Brig is nerfed, then the Hammond meta will be more dominant, and then you won't be seeing Diva anymore. You'll just be seeing like Hammond and triple DPS comp, which I feel like are very chaotic. And so I think there's like a very fine line of like how much they can tweak the GOATS comp, and or like how much they can tweak the DPS comps because each buff or nerf is gonna just like uh, either boost one comp up too high and or like nerf one comp way too way too low on to the ground so i think it's very difficult saying like what should be nerfed i feel like in this scenario 